Gary Tan, you are a legendary Silicon Valley investor, a former partner in Y Combinator, a co-founder of Initialized Capital, along with Alexis Ohanian. You're also an early investor in Coinbase, which you've called your best investment ever. We'll talk more about that. You're bullish on crypto more generally. Uh, you've had just an extraordinary life, and we're going to get to all of that in just a moment. But Gary, first, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to where you are today? Well, where do, where do we start? Um, I, you know, for me, I'm a software engineer uh, to begin with. And um, I saw a documentary very early called The Machine That Changed the World uh, when I was 14 years old. And um, a lot of the things that they talked about in that documentary have basically come true. That, uh, you know, we live in this age where software is eating absolutely everything in the world. And uh, now, you know, as a investor, you know, running a fund with over a billion dollars under management, what I realize is this is actually a one-time shift, at least for our lifetimes. And so that's why you're seeing these, you know, decacorn companies being minted with um, far faster sort of pace than ever before. And, um, you know, being a venture capitalist for the last 10 years, we got a front row seat to seeing exactly that. And the growth of crypto to me is really about um, software eating money. And money is the underpinning of society. So it's just been remarkable. And I feel like we're just, you know, even the early innings, you know, it's uh, Brian Armstrong, when they went direct listing, came on my YouTube channel and he said, uh, we are at, you know, 1% on the progress bar, which is, uh, if that's true, that that's a pretty wild claim. <laughs> and I, you know, I think that it's probably true. Um, you know, we, we haven't really seen the full rollout of what software means in society yet. I mean, we've only had smartphones for even 10 years and uh, it's already changed so many things. Yeah. So let's zoom the camera back a little bit, particularly for people who are not in the tech space. Uh, you cite the uh, famous uh, Mark Andreessen statement about how software is eating the world. Tell us a little bit about how we got to where we are today. Obviously, the revolution that we're seeing right now uh, with cryptocurrency, uh, in some senses, is a, is a continuation of the revolution we saw beginning in the 90s with the internet. You've been present uh, for a great deal of this revolution. Tell us a little bit about what the broad narrative is when you zoom the camera out. How do you see what's happening in the valley, in technology, and how has that come to impact, as you say, money? If we want to zoom all the way out, um, what, the, what software actually is, um, is actually an infinite book. And um, there's a whole episode in this uh, 1990s documentary uh, that's dedicated to this. They, they call it, you know, my favorite episode in that, if you go back and watch it on YouTube, is um, the paperback computer. And the big idea there is that, you know, 500 years ago, illuminated manuscripts cost as much as a home, uh, you know, equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, they were guarded in towers by a priesthood. And uh, if you look at computers, like that's really how computers were 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And um, now we are something like, you know, 40 years into an ongoing revolution, which is um, that computer being in every desk, in every home, but now in every pocket. And then now, you know, through the internet, perhaps through Starlink and things like that, actually on every inch of the planet, um, you know, instantly on tap, compute, at, you know, whenever you need it. And um, I don't think that we even have fully understood what that means for society. And uh, the reason why we get to sit here, you know, talking about ideas is actually um, that revolution. You know, at some point you could put pen to paper and transfer knowledge, and then we didn't have to keep, you know, learning the same thing over and over again the hard way. And so, you know, modern enlightenment society is the result of this communication technology over the course of 500 years since the Gutenberg printing press. And um, only in the past 50 years, and like really in our lifetimes, are we actually seeing the full sort of rollout of what that means in society? Um, and that's really, I mean, it's at once very scary, but also very, very cool. And what it took the book 500 years to create modern society, we're, you know, seeing, uh, 
that next wave like before our very eyes. Yeah, well, that is the big picture from the Middle Ages through the Enlightenment uh, to where we are today. I'm curious, you talk about your passion for technology. Uh, when did you first begin to think that maybe you might want to do something uh, other than being uh, an engineer, other than working directly in the technology itself? How did you decide to make the transition to full-time investor? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. I mean, honestly, I have to credit Stanford, honestly. Um, you know, I grew up um, the children of uh, Chinese immigrants who, you know, they struggled, honestly. And, you know, at times we were food insecure growing up. And, uh, you know, watching that documentary and then being obsessed with computers, that was like winning the lottery. I mean, I learned how to make web pages when I was 14, opened up the yellow pages and started cold calling the internet section to get my first job. And I took the, you know, earnings from that and helped my parents um, pay the down payment for their first home, which, you know, I got to live in and my parents still live in today. That's really what I want is, um, I guess it was being food insecure that made me, you know, go out and realize like I need to go and get skills that other people need. And um, technology was something that a lot of people continue to need. And then getting into Stanford and studying computer science, I ended up working with um, or, you know, being friends with uh, people who knew Peter Thiel. And so in 2003, I graduated, I went up to Microsoft and then friends of mine, um, you know, were starting a company with Peter Thiel in 2004. And they said, come have dinner with him. So I flew down from Seattle, I had dinner with him at a uh, restaurant that's now, uh, I think 5A5 Steakhouse in San Francisco. But at the time it was a uh, French restaurant that Peter had opened called Frison. Uh, it was not very good, unfortunately. I think the restaurant closed. But about that time, he actually wrote the half a million dollar check to Facebook that made him a billionaire the first time around. And you know, he, he was a well known figure by then. He had sold PayPal. I'd had I had invited him to come speak at Stanford to talk about entrepreneurship before. He said, "Gary, what are you doing at Microsoft? You're wasting your time. Um, come join us. We're going to go change the world." And I uh, said, thank you very much, Mr. Thiel. Oh, I, before he said that, he also said, how much a year do you make? And I said, $70,000 a year, sir. And he said, I'll write you a personal check for that right now. Cash that check, quit your job. This is zero risk opportunity for you. And um, I said, thank you very much, Mr. Thiel, but I might get promoted next year. And I got on a plane and went back to Seattle. And of course that tr company turned out to be Palantir. And, uh, you know, which I think is around $40 billion market cap today. Don't feel too bad for me. I ended up joining as employee number 10. I designed the logo, built one of the major product teams from scratch. And that's what really taught me that um, there's something really magic about Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, what's funny is in 2021, we talk about Silicon Valley like it's a real place, but actually it's just on the internet now. <laughs> it's, you know, the Valley is not, um, you know, a collection of small towns on the peninsula of San Francisco in, on, on the Bay Area. It's actually, uh, you know, the internet at this point. It's that, that spirit is everywhere in the world now. And that's a very good thing, I'd say. Um, but being able to see, uh, you know, what at the time for me, it seemed like outrageous amounts of money put towards bringing together teams of builders. So software engineers, designers, product people, like those were really the people who were the essential set of people to create something from scratch. And, uh, you know, I, I think as an engineer and as someone who did not come from wealth, I had no conception that there was this much money sitting in bank accounts across the world. And of course, now fast forward to today, we live in a world where capital is absolutely fungible and, and you know, great abundance. And what is rare and what I want desperately to have happen not just 10 or 100 x more but a thousand like 10,000 x more is for very very smart people to be sort of unshackled from systems that you know basically give them bs jobs yeah like the the amount of like incredible brain power that is wasted in the world is somewhat outrageous if you think about it and um and I want them to be, you know, driven to create new organizations, new products, new services that go out and actually solve the very many deeply rooted issues in our society. And, you know, I think that now's the time to do that. You know, if you, if you take the zoom out picture on software rewriting all of society, 
um, well, technology is the pen and the pen is available. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.